picture the scene. It's 1999. Freddo chocolate bars are 10p. Premium fuel is costing 62 pence a litre. And for £3.30, you've just picked up this, the latest edition of Max Power magazine. Life is good. And it's made all the better because car manufacturers are having a go at this new age of sports cars, hot hatches. And Audi have thrown their hat into the ring with this, the Audi S3. Now the S3 was actually quite a significant car of the time when you consider that the hot hatch of the era, a Golf GTI, had 150 horsepower, this thing came out of the factory with 210. And then a few years later, the power was bumped up to 225. Now, if I also ask you to consider that the supercar of the era, the brand new 360 Moderna Ferrari, had 400 horsepower, you start to realize that this was quite a significant thing. But now, let's jump to the present day, sadly. Freddo chocolate bars are now 30p, premium fuel is dangerously close to two pounds a litre, and chances are, if you were to read most of the content of this magazine out loud in a public space, you'd be arrested and added to the sort of register that would hinder future employment. But it's not all doom and gloom, because the Audi S3 has evolved into this. Now, obviously, this is a car with a lot more power, 400 horsepower, believe it or not. So driving around London, probably not gonna be the best test. So we're gonna wave goodbye to the glorious green S3 and head for the glorious green countryside and see what this thing's all about. Welcome to the countryside and welcome to the new Audi RS3. So we left behind London and we left behind that lovely 1999 S3. And I think it is fair to say that this is a follow on. It's an evolution of that lovely S3. Now, a lot has changed since 1999. Obviously the dimensions of the car have got uh, significantly bigger. It's become longer, it's become wider and no doubt quite a bit heavier. But the other big difference is, of course, what's under the bonnet, the engine. Now, the S3 was significant with its 1.8 litre turbocharged four cylinder. That, as I said before, came out of the factory with 210 brake horsepower, and then it was bumped up to 225. This thing, though, this is another story altogether. The engine itself, believe it or not, is the same lump that has been in Audi RS3s since 2012. That's quite a long time, but in that time, it's been refined, it's been developed, the engine internals have been upgraded, and that means that it's able to push out more power. Then of course, there's the technology that comes with engine mapping. Audi are now able to push out of the factory in a stock car, 400 brake horsepower and 500 Newton meters of torque. That is big power. But beyond the power and beyond the newton meters of torque, this engine does something far more special. It's nothing to do with speed. It's nothing to do with torque. It's this. There is nothing, and I repeat, nothing in the world of hatchbacks that sounds like an RS3. There may be people watching at home thinking, gosh, that sounds almost like half a V10 Lamborghini, half a Huracan. Well, guess what? It is, sort of. The engine that's in this thing was supposedly developed, in part at least, by Lamborghini. And of course, it is half of the V10 engine that went into both the Lamborghini Huracan, the Lamborghini Gallardo, and now, of course, this thing's big, big brother, the Audi R8 V10 Plus. 
I know that there is an abundance of hot hatchbacks on the market now, certainly a lot more than there were back in the late 1990s. You've got things like the Golf R, you've got Hyundai producing hot hatches, AMG Mercedes producing hot hatches, BMW M cars are now classed as hot hatches. But this thing, this does something that none of those others do, and that is make the sound of half a Lamborghini. Of course, with the turbo up front, you can hear the turbo spooling under acceleration. You can short shift this thing and it sounds just as exciting as it does taking it all the way up to the red line. The turbo spools, you go up a gear, and it just carries on spooling. It spools and spools and spools. Lift off the throttle, mid acceleration, and you get this glorious dump valve, a little chatter from the wastegate. The engine, it's a masterpiece. I can't get over it. It is a masterpiece. And you know what? I don't even think that it particularly matters that it's not a new engine because, well, why fix it? Why change it? It works. It's perfect. It was perfect in 2012. And now with new internals and new engine maps, it's even more perfect. But it's not changed entirely for the better. Well, for some people at least. For me, I'm not too fussed, but there will be a lot of people watching this that probably know what I'm about to say already. The noise has changed slightly. It still has that glorious acceleration burble. It still does all the wastegate chatters and whooshy noises that you want your turbo to do. But what it doesn't do is the pops and the bangs and the crackles. The reason for that, once again, due to new European bureaucratic law. The way that hot hatchbacks previously have had that crackly, bangy, poppy, rumbly noise go through the exhaust was quite simply fuel being injected into the exhaust system to create the effect of unburned fuel coming out the back. That's what was doing the popping, the banging and the crackling. In this, due to those new rules, they're no longer allowed to do it and therefore it doesn't have the same effect. Now, usually I'd be celebrating that because as I've mentioned many times before, both on previous videos and in our podcast, I'm not really a big fan of fabricated exhaust noises. Rumbles, pops, bangs and crackles on classic and historic racing cars with straight through exhaust systems, very good. When it's kind of plumbed into your hot hatchback, it's a bit weird and confusing and upsetting. But the Audi RS3 previously was given a huge amount of character. I kind of feel like because it was a five cylinder, because it had such a unique sound, it kind of got away with it. And for the first time, I kind of feel like I'm missing out, which is a bit weird. It's conflicting me. Now we must move on because not only is the car bigger, is the engine bigger and is the power output bigger, there's also one other thing that's significantly bigger than the Audi S3, the price. The Audi S3, when it came out in 1999, was priced at about £15,000. Not a small amount of money, and if we adjust that with inflation, in today's money, £15,000 works out to be about £28,000. So again, significant amount of money. So, you might think that given £28,000 was the original price in today's money, perhaps this new model might be five, maybe £10,000 more. It's not. The car that we're sat in right now, this very Audi RS3, it's £67,000. It's a couple of thousand pounds short of 70 grand. And I'm gonna say it again to save you skipping back five seconds to see if you misheard because you didn't. It's 67,000 pounds. Yeah, yeah. Now you don't need to be Rachel Riley to figure out that that is a significant jump. But here's the thing, everything is expensive now. 
fuel is expensive now. If you want any other form of hot hatchback, it's expensive now. Look at the prices of A45 AMGs. Look at the prices of M Sport hatchbacks now. Things are just expensive. And here's the other thing. As mad as it sounds, nobody's really looking at car prices anymore as the lump sum figure because so few people are going into showrooms these days and paying the bank transfer for the full price. You're doing monthlies, you're doing PCPs, you're doing HPs, or you're doing some sort of vehicle lease. So even if you're putting down a hefty deposit and negotiating a big balloon payment at the end, chances are you're gonna be looking at four or 500 quid a month to have one of these. And are you even gonna worry about that balloon payment later on? Probably not, because you're gonna end up getting the next model when it comes out and moving all of that finance package onto the next car. So whilst I do say with a slightly gritted teeth that that price doesn't really matter, it kind of doesn't really matter and it is pretty relevant with just about everything else on the market today. Still, 70 grand. So let's talk about what this car is like to drive. We're gonna park the engine to one side for a moment. First things first, the way that this thing rides, it rides beautifully. This has got the option for multiple suspension settings, obviously like just about every other hot hatch over the era. You've got multiple driver modes, everything from efficiency for better fuel economy through to dynamic for the more sprightly driving. Of course, in dynamic, you've got the options to customize the way the car is, the way it steers, the way it feels through the damper settings, the throttle response, all of it's adjustable and all of it I find very intuitive and very enjoyable. The gearbox isn't the fastest I've experienced considering it is a DCT, but it does the job. The carbon ceramics on the front, a bit of an interesting one. I don't know if that's an option I would pick for myself. It is firstly very, very expensive and I can't really say that I think it's going to add much to the driver experience. Car carbon ceramics make a lot of sense if you're driving on track very often, but if you are just doing road driving, the steel brakes probably aren't going to give to the average driver too much of a difference. Inside the car, it's a bit of a love-hate relationship for me. There are some things I really like. The Audi interface I think is fantastic. I've really liked Audi cars of the past few years. This current generation with a good mixture of touchscreen and physical buttons is good. I like the fact that the climate control is all done with physical buttons now, as opposed to having to find your way through on touchscreens. I find anything that involves you having to look away from the road in order to find something on the screen, it's never really a good thing. This does have the buttons, which is obviously very, very good. The touchscreen interface is also very, very good. The wireless Apple CarPlay has been faultless and it's got loads of other creature comforts, things like a Bang & Olufsen sound system. Again, an option, but it is wonderful. One that I think is definitely worth having. Being a hot hatch with sporty tires, there is a bit of road noise to compete with, but nothing that I found is too intrusive or upsetting. It's just something that you're gonna have to deal with. On the subject of wheel and tires, you may have noticed there's something quite curious about this car when you look at it from the outside. And that is that the front wheels are actually wider than the rears. And I didn't actually know this until the car was dropped off. In fact, I was reading through the press release and reading through the spec sheet and I thought there was a typo because it said front tires 26530 profile and rear 24535. I thought surely they've got that the wrong way around, but no. Audi have actually decided to put on a wider track on the front of the car than the rear for a couple of reasons. Firstly, whilst it is a four-wheel drive system, as standard, most of the power goes to the front. So to avoid things like torque steer and to give you a maximized grip, what they've done is put a wider track on the front. That also combats things like understeer, that's where you're turning into a corner and the car tries to wash out and push forward. But also it is for a fun factor as well. This Audi has a setting called RS Torque Rear. They ask that you only use it when you're driving on track, not on the road, but what it effectively does is it throws more power to the back and reduces the power to the front to give the car the characteristics of a rear wheel drive one. It means you can power slide your Audi RS3. And that's pretty cool. Obviously I wouldn't know because I've only been driving this on the road and I haven't tried it, but uh, from what I hear, 
It's really quite impressive. Other things in the car do leave me a bit conflicted, which again kind of goes back to the price point. Things like the plastics around the car. I feel like for 70 grand, if I was getting a car that had lots of options in and around it for carbon fiber, things like the carbon fiber dashboard, 700 pounds, and the carbon fiber engine cover, 400 pounds. I'd probably want to see less of the plastic you would find in an entry level Audi A1. The same thing goes for the seat bases. The seats themselves are beautiful, lovely suede, possibly Alcantara stitched, extremely comfortable, heated, electric, electronically adjustable, all of it absolutely faultless. But then they put cheap plastic on the bottom. Why? It's a contrast of extremes. You know, this is a big money car. I want all of it to be big money materials. I thought what I'd do is I'd stop for a minute just to read through some of those options because I feel like we need to kind of give the car some justification. So I've got the spec sheet here for this exact car. So the model itself starts at 51 grand, 51,770 pounds to be exact. Then they've added things like the comfort and sound pack. That's the Bang & Olsen stereo, which as I say is glorious, but it does come with a price tag of 1,195 pounds. The three zone climate control, 290 pounds. If you want a heads up display, I've never been that fond of them really, 770 pounds. Uh, the carbon engine cover, as I mentioned before, £480. The RS Dynamic Pack, that's the ceramic brakes, the slightly more power and the increased top speed, which I believe is close to around 170 miles an hour. Racist for this one, £5,500. The adaptive suspension, it's glorious, but it, as is the price, £960 for that one. Uh, the digital matrix headlights, I have to say, are fantastic, but again, £670. Traffic sign recognition, why do we need that in a car? £240, we don't need that. £240 to read the sign that we've already read. The power adjustable front seats, have a guess. No, more, £670. The power operated tailgate, we don't need that. £345, we can take that off. Um, yeah, here's a controversial one as well. The black badge styling. So that's a black badge on the front and a black RS3 badge on the back. £290. Ooh. Actually, no, add on a £100 because the RS exterior gloss in black, uh, that is also a badge, I believe. So that takes that up to uh, £390. £400 for some black badges. Uh, the slightly bigger wheels than you can get out of the factory. That's an option, £575. That seems like quite a good value to me. Um, black mirror surrounds. Yeah, you've got to pay for those. £50. Tire pressure and monitor system. TPMS, 195 quid. Yeah, good thing to have, especially if you are doing track days and things. You keep an eye on your temperatures and your pressures. Uh, the four-way lumbar support, £260. I'd probably be tempted by that. These seats are extremely comfortable. And then things like adaptive cruise control, which I have to say, extremely good on this. Some cars, I hate it and can't stand it. In this car, I've really quite enjoyed driving it up and down the motorways and just letting it cruise along. And things like an Audi phone box. I don't know what that is. Maybe that's the wireless charging system. 195 quid, quite a lot of money. Now, that does take everything up, including if you want to get the car delivered for £660 and a road fund licence of £1,400 plus a first registration fee of £55. The total retail price of this car, £67,905. Welcome. 2022. Do you see what happened there? I just pulled away and accelerated and I immediately forgot the price. Immediately forgot it.
this is a special car. This is a very, very special car. You hear that acceleration? Suddenly I'm not that fussed about plastic trim. You know what this is like? This is like your annoying mate in the pub. The one that always has a little bit too much to drink and gets a little bit loud and a bit rowdy and everyone else kind of rolls their eyes and goes, oh God, what's he done now? The RS3 is like that. You forgive your mate because he's got an amazing personality and he's really lovely and lovable. So you go, oh God, Dan's had a bit too much to drink again. He's got a bit excitable. But you love Dan, so you kind of get over it. You forgive him. Oh, it's Dan. He's, he's lovely, lovely Dan. Well, in this, you've got that lovely, lovely engine. So you could go, oh God, it is a bit, it is a bit expensive, isn't it? Oh, it has got some cheapy plastic trim here and there. Oh yeah, I'm not too sure about having to spend 400 quid on black badges, but, oh, hang on. Oh, it doesn't matter. Because it's got that lovely, lovely engine. The engine is the charm. Puts on the charm and you go, no, oh, it's, it's fine. Didn't want to go back to that pub anyway. I don't mind that we've been barred for life. Uh, this car reminds me a lot of my mate Dan, actually. Hi, Dan. Driving on roads like this is what this car is designed for, and that's why I was so keen to get out of London as quickly as possible. Driving on 60 mile an hour roads out in the countryside is exactly what this car is for. It is a car that you can use every single day. You can use this as a family car if you wanted to. There's plenty of room in the back. It's got ISO fix for kiddie seats. You can drive it to the office every day, and you can also enjoy it at the weekends. Thank you for watching today's video. Don't forget, you can see everything that we do at drivenchat.com. Also have a look at all the other videos that we've uploaded so far onto YouTube. And of course, our podcasts. Find the Driven Chat podcast in all the usual podcast places and hear a new episode featuring myself, Amy Shaw and Andy Kay every single week.